we begin with a few moments of concentration to the divine grace that has brought us together. And with gratitude and humility, remember that we are here on earth to fulfill his dream, to change this earthly life to life divine, and to be the instruments to help conquer death through divine love. We are beginning with the line, whether to bear with ignorance and death, or hew the ways of immortality, to win or lose the godlike game for man, was her soul's issue thrown with destiny's dice. Now, I have so much to share with you on this. There's going to be so much. First, from Sri Aurobindo. He writes, that his poet knows Savitri as the forerunner or first creator of a new race. The forerunner or first creator of a new race. All poets have lines which are bare and direct statements and meant to be that in order to carry their full force. But to what category he belongs or whether a line is only passable or more than that depends on various circumstances. Shakespeare's line, to be or not to be, that is the question, introduces powerfully one of the most famous of all soliloquies, and it comes in with great dramatic force. But in itself, it is a bare statement. Now, I want to read a little of that for you because I think it's so relevant to this. This will just take a minute or two, but it's so important and I won't read the whole thing. To be or not to be, that is the question. Whether it is nobler in the mind to suffer the slings and arrows of outrageous fortune, or to take arms against the sea of troubles, and by opposing, end them, to die, to sleep, no more. And by a sleep to say we end the heartache and the thousand natural shocks that flesh is heir to. Tis a consummation devoutly to be wished, to die, to sleep, to sleep, uh, perchance to dream. Aye, there's the rub. For in that sleep of death, what dreams may come when we have shuffled off this mortal coil must give us pause. There's the respect that makes calamity of so long life. But the dread of something after death, the undiscovered country from whose born no traveler returns, puzzles the will and makes of us rather bear those ills we have than fly to others that we know not of. Thus, conscious d conscience does make cowards of us all. And now we have savagery, whether to bear with ignorance and death, or hew the ways of immortality, to win or lose the godlike game for man, was her soul's issue thrown with destiny's dice. So we see here that Sri Aurobindo, that, that there are some echoes of Shakespeare in this. This idea of having to bear with ignorance, having to bear with death, or the opposite that is only possible for savagery to hew the ways of immortality even to win or to lose the godlike game for man. That was where her soul's issue was thrown with destiny's dice.
And now Sri Aurobindo takes, takes us into a totally different area because he tells us something of Savitri's inner force, but not to submit and suffer was she born, to lead, to deliver was her glorious part. So let us carry on and maybe, uh, maybe you could read for us a few lines. Could you do that? I don't have your name here. Okay. Yes, my name is Falguni. Uh, yeah, I will read. Okay. Here was no fabric of torrential make fit for a day's use by busy careless powers. Ah, so here was no fabric of terrestrial make, the earth's make. She was not a fabric of the earth's make. She is a very different uh, being, and we're going to hear about that in a few minutes. And most of us, or many of us at least, are fit for a day's use by busy, careless powers. Yeah, whoever would like to I read. read. Um, yeah, please. I could read Shankari. Yes, please, Shankari. Yes, Shankari. Here was no fabric of terrestrial make fit for a day's use by busy, careless powers. An image fluttering on the screen of fate half animated for a passing show or a castaway on the ocean of desire, flung to the eddies in a ruthless sport and tossed along the gulfs of circumstance. A creature born to bend beneath the yoke, a chattel and a plaything of time's lords or one more pawn who comes destined to be pushed, one slow move forward on a measureless board. In the chess play of the earth's soul with doom, such is the human figure drawn by time. Well, so much to cover here. <laughs> Okay, an image fluttering on the screen of fate. That's how the divine often sees us. We're just basically an image fluttering on the screen of fate, like in a motion picture, half animated only for a passing show, or a castaway on the ocean of desire. And we find that ocean of desire is unfathomable. It is so vast. Or flung to the eddies in a, in a ruthless sport and tossed along the gulfs of circumstance. Look how beautifully Sri Arbindo brings in these words. First of all, we have the ocean of desire. Then we have the eddies in a ruthless sport. And then we have the gulfs of circumstance. Extraordinary, just so beautiful. So he is describing humanity here. This is not savagery. She is not a creature born to bend beneath the yoke. She's not a chattel. <laughs> A serf and a plaything of time's lords. She is also not a pawn who comes destined to be pushed one slow move forward on a measureless board in the chess play of the earth's soul with doom. Such is the human figure drawn by time. Now, I would like to quote to you from a, a poet I have found to be 
at times extremely fine. His name is Conrad Aiken, and he has written a long poem and a powerful poem called Tetelestai. These are the last words of Christ, and it means it is finished. Just some lines, not too many lines. How shall we praise the magnificence of the dead? The great man humbled, the haughty brought to dust. Is there a horn we should not blow as proudly for the meanest of us all? Who creeps his days, guarding his heart from blows to die obscurely? I am no king, have laid no kingdoms waste, taken no princes captive, led no triumphs of weeping women through long walls of trumpets. Say rather, I am no one, or an atom. Say rather, two great gods in a vault of starlight play ponderingly at chess. And at the game's end, one of the pieces, shaken, falls to the floor and runs to the darkest corner. And that piece, forgotten there, left motionless, is I. Oh, how powerful. So we see that Savitri is not this pawn who is going to be pushed a slow move forward on a measureless board in this great chess play of the earth soul with doom. And then he tells us, such is the human figure drawn by time. Let me go back just a little bit to these other lines here. Because she is not an image that flutters on this screen of fate. She is not an image. She is a being. In fact, we're going to get to that in a moment. What kind of being she is. She's not a castaway on the ocean of desire, which so many are. She's not flung to the eddies in a, a ruthless sport, ruthless, without any mercy, or tossed. So we have castaway, flung, and tossed again. Or the creature born to bend, beneath the yoke. Extraordinary. Extraordinarily beautiful. And then a chattel, a serf, and a plaything of, of the lords of time. Because the lords of time ha have most of us as playthings until we become suddenly conscious in however we are touched that there is more to this life than to be a plaything or a chattel or tossed on the ocean of desire or, or one more pawn who comes destined to be pushed one slow move, move forward on this measureless board. We have to see this board as an infinite board. And on that board, there's a chess play of the earth soul with doom. Such is the human figure drawn by time. And now we come to this very, very important line that fully describes Savitri. A conscious frame was here, a self-born force. Now I want to call your attention to this word this hyphenated word, self-born. Sri Aurobindo uses this word six times in Savitri. And this is the first time we find it. A conscious frame was here, a self-born force. To be self-born means that mother chose all of her births from the beginning 
of the evolution. She chose to be here helping mankind or even the animals, even the plants before them to progress in the evolutionary uplift. So we also find the Lord speaking to Ashrapati. And he says to Ashrapati in the book of the Divine Mother, page 340, adept of the self-born unfailing line, leave not the light to die the ages bore. Help still humanity's blind and suffering life. So now we both see that they are both self-born forces. Could someone else read? Uh, in this enigma of dusk of God, this slow and strange, uneasy compromise of limiting nature with a limitless soul, where all must move between an ordered child's and an uncaring blind necessity. Too high is the fire spiritual dare not blaze. If once it may... That, that's all. That's, that's fine. Now, there are a couple of things. You made two mistakes in reading, and that is because you're reading a little too fast. So okay. let's go and do it again, reading it a little slower. In this enigma of the dusk of God, this slow and strange, uneasy compromise of limiting nature with a limitless soul, where all must move between an ordered chance and an uncaring blind necessity. Too high is the fire spiritual dare not blaze. I heard too high is the fire spiritual dare not blaze. It's too high the fire spiritual dare not blaze. But you read much better this time. Okay, okay. now we begin. In this enigma, this great puzzle of the dusk of God, this slow and strange, uneasy compromise. What is the compromise? Of limiting nature with a limitless soul. Savitri is a limitless soul. And nature has to compromise <laughs> with this limitless soul. How can she do this? Because he says then where all has to move between an ordered chance and an uncaring blind necessity. Well, we know about this blind necessity because we, we are always finding necessities and they're often a blind necessity. And in that compromise, where all of us has to move between an ordered chance, an ordered chance, so chance here is not really chance as we understand it. Even karma is not as we understand it. Because chance here is ordered. There's an ordered chance. Things happen because they have to happen. They're destined to happen. Yes, the greatest souls can reverse their fate. And we will get to that in Savitri. But most of us move between an ordered chance and the blind necessity that really is uncaring. And therefore, too high the fire spiritual dare not blaze. Well, Sri Aurobindo tells us that on the hearth within us, the psychic being, there's a small spark. And we have to allow that spark to grow into a flame. But if it grows too fast, 
and too high, we will be destroyed. The body could not handle this. And the divine knows this. And so mother tells us that nothing is given to you more than you can handle. Sometimes we would ask that question, really? Because I've been through so much, so much. But it is the truth. The divine leads, but he does not goad. He does not goad. Now, we've talked about this spiritual fire that dare not blaze in us until we're ready for it. And when we are ready for it, it will be there. It will come. We just have to prepare our beings. Can someone else read now? If one should make the intense original flame, an answering touch might settle all measures need and art sink down. Well, that's what we were just talking about. If once it met this intense original flame, the original flame of the divine, the creative, could easily shatter all measures made, especially if earth answered this, it would sink down with the weight of the infinite. The next line now is interesting because Sri Aurobindo uses the word jail and spells it G-A-O-L. In the rest of Savitri and in all of his writings, he writes it J-A-I-L. But here we see him writing G-A-O-L, the old uh, English word for J-A-I-L. Wow, a jail is this immense material world. Wow. Ah, across each road, there's a stone-eyed law that stands armed. Now this law is, Mother speaks about this law. Uh, he capitalizes the L. It's law capital. That means you do not do this, you do do this, you cannot cross this, you may cross this. The law decides what we can do. But it's stone-eyed, it's stone-eyed, it's, uh, it's not easy, it's not easy. And not only that, but at every gate, these sentinels who are huge and dim, they pace. Because they actually sit on judgment, sit in on judgment. We'll get to that in just a second. Across a jail is this immense material world. Across each road stands armed a stone-eyed law at every gate. Oh, hold on, hold on. In sentinel's pace. Would someone else read, please? Can I read? Yes. This is Anita. Certainly. A great tribunal of the ignorance, an inquisition of the priestess of night, in judgment sit on the adventurer soul and the dual tables and the karmic norm, restrain the titan in her and the god, pain with its lash, joy with its silver bribe. God the wheels circling immobility. There is very much. Thank you. Um, 
this is a very difficult passage, very difficult, because we have uh, a tribunal, an inquisition, we have a judgment, we have a karmic norm, we have the titan in us, we have pain, and we have the wheel. We have to cover all of these things. How do we begin? A great tribunal of the ignorance. Well, Sri Aurobindo here is taking us into an area that we, we really don't meet very often. We don't, we're not able to enter that area so easily. First of all, he uses gray. So it's a shadowy area. And a tribunal is a group of people who make judgments. But this is a tribunal of the ignorance. And he capitalizes the I of ignorance. It's so interesting. Because we have this group of beings, this tribunal, of the ignorance, comma, an inquisition. So we have a tribunal, now we have priests. An inquisition of the priests of night. These are the dark forces. The dark forces that tempt us, that invade us, that enter our thoughts, enter our hearts, enter our vital natures. And they sit in judgment on the soul that would be the adventurer. The one who would adventure, they sit in judgment on him. Why do they do that? Well, there are the dual tables. And Vladimir, can you tell us a bit about the dual tables from the Vedas? Actually, I, I do not know what you mean. Can you explain dual tables, please? Yes. The dual tables and the karmic norm. So the dual tables here, for me, represent the, oh, we could almost say <laughs> the Ten Commandments. <laughs> like, like, like the Ten Commandments, these dual tables, these tables of laws. Uh, the the stone-eyed laws and where the dim sentinels pace and the great tribunal is there of the ignorance and, and the karmic norm. The karmic norm and the dual tables are the area in which we live. We live trying to balance out these things, trying to purify purify ourselves, trying to, trying to get over our karmic of past li karma of past lives. But that karmic norm is very strong and those dual tables are written in stone. And they restrain the titan in us and the god. Now this is very interesting because Sri Aurobindo capitalizes the T of titan. And you see, the Titan is Nietzsche's Superman, in essence, the one who grabs at God, who, who will go to any length to attain his goal, sometimes a very good one, sometimes bad. Sri Aurobindo speaks much more about the Titan in Savitri, and we'll learn about him as we go along. But not only do they restrain the Titan in us, they also restrain God in us. So we have this very, very interesting one, two, three, four, five, six, seven lines we find that this material world is an immense jail. 
the whole material world, the immense material world is, is like a jail because at each road stands this law that is stone-eyed and it's armed also. And at every gate that we would pass through, these huge sentinels, guardians, they pace back and forth, back and forth. And then this gray tribunal of the ignorance. Now, we have learned from history about the Inquisitions. And the Inquisitions were one of the blackest marks on Christianity of all time. Uh, I think they happen today also with some sects. An Inquisition of the Priests of Night wanting to see whether you are pure or not, and they would torture people. We won't go too deeply into that. But they sit in judgment on this adventurous soul. And these dual tables and this karmic norm, norm restrain in us the Titan and the God. Pain with its lash. Joy with its silver bribe. And here we get into the image of Judas accepting the 30 pieces of silver to betray Christ. Here Sri Aurobindo changes it and he says that joy can be a silver bribe also if we if we accept it in the wrong way. So pain with its lash, joy with its silver bribe. What do all these things do? They guard the wheels circling immobility. We have spoken about this wheel. Sri Aurobindo uses a capital W for wheel, capital W, the wheel that is spinning in the sky and the people, black people of America early on saw the wheel in the sky. Um, a large wheel run by the grace of God, a little wheel by man. And it's a circling immobility. It doesn't move. It's a wheel that is just fixed in its course and goes on and on. We're going to end there today. Our time is up. And if you could read some passages for next week, it will help us a lot. And I thank you all. Namaste. So many of you joined us, and I'm so grateful that you joined us. Thank you so much. Namaste. Namaste. Thank you so much. Thank you, Naraji. Thank you so much, Naraji. I'm glad. I'm glad you all came. I'm very happy. Because to live in savitry, to, to breathe savitry, is to make the greatest progress we could make. We can do our entire sadhana through savitry. Namaste, y'all. Namaste. 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 Thank you.